Hello there everybody, Sam Strains here, welcome back to the railway and welcome to a bit of a loco showcase, although this is one with a bit of a difference, because unlike in most of my videos, today's locos were not professionally manufactured, nor are they available to buy, and that's because they were all made right here in this room by me. <laughs> I've been creating my own locos for about two years now, and in that time I've created six different locos. And all of these locos have been designed on my computer from scratch, and then they were 3D printed in this room on my 3D printers, and after that I would hand finish them and then paint them either by hand or by airbrush. And these are the locos that I'm going to show you today. I'm going to start right at the beginning with the first ever loco that I created, and that is the only one that I would say I'm not proud of. Quite hideous. Well, I guess we'll start with that then. So, this loco is known as the Sam's Trains prototype, I guess. And we all have to start somewhere, and this is where I started. So, clearly this so-called loco is not based on any loco in real life. In fact, this loco literally just started out as a chassis, and it was a chassis that was designed as a proof of concept. I wanted to see whether it would be possible to motorise an entirely 3D printed chassis, and of course it was. The 3D printed chassis are obviously much lighter than your professional die-cast ones, but in terms of performance, the 3D printed chassis works just as well as your typical, let's say, Hornby chassis, and so the concept was proved. But then I wanted to know, can I create an entire loco with my 3D printers, not just a chassis? So that's when I decided to create this hideous body, and also the tender. And as you can imagine, this is where things got ugly. Now, it's not that I was really trying to make this stuff look bad, it's just I wasn't using drawings or any real prototypes. I was just winging it without any regard for scale or realism. And so this very odd loco body indeed was created. And I was quite proud of this at the time. Now I'm not at all proud of this. I think it's hideous. But I do have a lot of fond memories of creating this loco from scratch. So quite briefly, let's take a close look at this. So then, how do we break this one down? Well, first of all, you'll notice the loco is quite tall, and that's because the chassis was quite tall. These days when I design a loco, obviously the chassis has got to fit in a body of a specific size, but that was not the case with this one. Here I was just designing a chassis for the heck of it, I didn't pay any attention to how tall it was, and therefore the body I built to fit onto the chassis ended up being gigantic. The other thing is that the vast majority of the detail on the loco was just 3D printed in place. There are very few separate parts. So that goes for the whistles and the safety valves, which I think I got away with quite nicely. You've got a mechanical lubricator around the other side, which I decided to give it for some reason. But then you've got detailing such as the lamp brackets, which don't look very good at all. In fact, where I did put separate parts on, the buffers for instance, they looked a lot better. This loco does have a painted cab, this was actually a later project where I wanted to see if I could paint a cab using airbrush masks. It was possible, but uh, obviously nothing to shout about. The tender I'm more pleased with, I think the tender is a little bit less ludicrous, it's still quite chunky and boxy looking, but um, I don't think it's quite as oversized of course as the loco is. So overall, I think you can say that I'm not very proud of the way this loco looks. This was my first ever project, so I do kind of look back on it fondly, but not proud of the way it looks. What I am proud of, though, is the way this loco performs. And as you can see, this one is a really, really good runner. And I don't quite understand how this was the first chassis I'd ever created, and yet it still remains one of the best running ones. I put it together and quite soon after the first assembly it just worked really really well. And I've never really had that since. Everything else I've designed has taken quite a lot of fettling and improving in order for it to work properly, whereas this one just ran straight away. So it gave me a, a bit of a false sense of security, I suppose, but still quite nice for a first experience. As for why it's such a good runner, I guess the motor is good in this one. All of my other projects use sort of cordless motors, whereas this one uses uh, the same sort of motor that Hornby use, a quality 5-pole motor, which does perform pretty well, so I guess that might be why. Either way, 
Not a loco that you want to sit and watch run particularly, unless you're a fan of this sort of freakish thing. So let's move on and let me show you the next loco on today's program. So after my first prototype was built and working, I wanted to have a go at creating something that wasn't a hideous monstrosity. And that all started with a trip to the Black Country Museum in Birmingham. And right outside the museum, there is this locomotive, which is a Manning Wardle L-Class. So during my time at the museum, I took lots of photos of the engine, getting as close as I could and capturing as many details as I could. And then I looked online and picked up as many photos and drawings as I could. And ultimately, I created this thing. Now, obviously, this loco is still not hugely impressive in terms of the level of finesse, but I think that it is a massive step up from the prototype loco that I created. So, for the first time, this model was designed to reflect a real-life locomotive. The proportions of it were scaled to match that prototype, and it had quite a few separate details, whereas the prototype had just a load of molded detail. Manning Wardle was a manufacturer of steam locomotives based in England, and they produced a small range of locomotives for contracting work. The L-Class was an industrial design produced over a huge number of years, the first in 1881 and the last in 1926. This locomotive, Winston Churchill, is one of only two remaining examples, the other being Sir Berkeley, which I believe has a very different cab design. Winston was one of the later ones built in 1923 and was owned by a small handful of different companies where it performed industrial duties until it was donated to the Black Country Museum in the 1970s where it resides to this day on static display. And like I say, this loco has a lot more in the way of detail than the prototype did. So now it's got some separately fitted handrails, it's got various pipework, it's got these little toolboxes on it, a much more refined buffer beam, and of course, much better cab detailing, even with some separately fitted parts. But I still had a lot to learn at this point when it came to creating 3D printed locos. For instance, I didn't sand the body down enough. I didn't spend enough time getting the body looking smooth. It might have looked perfectly smooth before I painted it, but as soon as this green went on, it was quite obvious that a lot more work was needed. And that is something that I carried on with my future locos and of course their bodies, as you will see, are much, much smoother than this one. But overall, I think for a first attempt at something realistic, it does seem to capture the prototype reasonably nicely. I wasn't able to get the white lining on this, and that's still something that I struggle with. And of course, the lettering and numbering on the side, they should be white, but are black instead, because that's easier to do at home. But overall, yeah, for a first try, I'm much, much happier with this. And I kind of wish this was my first ever loco so that I could show this to people. And they might be a bit more impressed by it than they are by that horrible thing that we saw a minute ago. Anyway, let's get this onto the track. Let's see how it runs. So I think, unlike the first loco, this one's not quite such a good runner. For a couple of reasons, first of all, I'm not dead keen on the Romford style wheels. Um, I put them together as best as I could and they were still a little bit wobbly with this. Also though, it's due to the form factor of the Loco. This is a tiny, tiny Loco and there just wasn't that much space to get a motor and lots of gears inside it. Ideally, if I'd had more room, I would have put an additional set of gears into this so that I could gear the motor speed down a bit more. As it is, I wasn't able to do that. So it is quite a speedy runner, but the saving grace is how good these modern cheap coreless motors are. Because even though this loco has to be turned right down on the controller in order to perform well, it's still quite smooth when you do so, which is quite often not the case with other motors. So I did do quite well out of this in the end. Again, this is quite a light loco because basically all of the interior of this model is taken up by the mechanism. There's a little bit of room above the motor for some weight, but I think there's only five or 10 grams worth in there. Of course, the professional manufacturers don't have quite so many constraints in this area because they can use die cast on their locos, which basically avoids the weight problem. But yeah, I have to do both with mine, otherwise I get pants pullers. But as you can see, with shorter freight trains, this one is fine. And I have to say, I do love this loco. It's just a cute design, isn't it? I loved it when I saw it at the museum and I'm really, really happy to have one in model form. And maybe I'll build another one one day to a higher standard. Uh, if I get time, that is something I'd love to do. 
So at this point, we were into the new year of 2022, and so far I'd created my hideous prototype and a very small tank engine, both of which were relatively successful. But now I wanted to try something a little bit more complex. I wanted to try a bigger project, maybe a tender loco, one that would really challenge me. And the loco I decided on was, of course, Gladstone. And this is her. And she remains the largest loco I have ever created. And she's also one of the most complex in terms of livery. Now, again, I don't think I got the livery absolutely right with this one, but obviously it was a lot more complex than the Manning Wardle. This was the first time I'd done a proper livery on a loco. So yes, the different shades of yellow don't entirely match up, and some of the lining is a little bit messy, but I think now that it's all together, the loco looks fairly decent, and I'm still so proud to actually own a Gladstone loco. It's a class that I've always wanted to have in double O scale, and the fact that I've got one now, always brings me a lot of joy. The LBSC B1 was a class of 36 naught 42 locomotives introduced in 1882 for express passenger work. Designed by William Stroudley of Terrier fame, this would actually be his final express passenger design, and arguably his finest. They were based on his previous Richmond class from four years earlier, except the Gladstones were larger. Withdrawal of every member of the class was complete by 1933, meaning that no examples survived into the British Railways era, at least not in service. But one example has been preserved, and of course it is this one, Gladstone. And I think this was an insane project to attempt after the Manning Wardle. I mean, the livery is still probably the most complex I've ever tried to attempt. And in places it doesn't look fantastic, you know, the printing isn't amazing, but in other places it looks awesome. I mean, that lining on the boiler is just absolutely fantastic. I still think that's some of the best lining I've ever been able to achieve. But still, the standard has been upped a little bit with this loco. As you can see, there's a little bit more finesse in the bodywork. There are now no visible layer lines from the 3D printing process, and that's because I sanded all of those out and got it nice and smooth and the finesse of some of the separate parts is much improved as well. I'm also not using Romford style wheels, I really didn't like those things. I know they are a kit building staple, but for me using some suitable Hornby wheels in this case made the loco look a lot better and made it a lot simpler to put together. The other wheels, the rear loco wheels and the tender wheels, those are 3D printed wheels which have been inserted into a Hornby tyre. Even this I found a lot better than trying to use Romford style ones, but each to their own. There's still room for improvement though, I think the cab detail wasn't fantastic, and I do improve on that with a later design. But on the whole, yeah, this remains one of my favourites. Such a fun project, and it came out relatively nicely. Anyway, let me show you its performance. So I think this loco of mine is possibly the most interesting mechanically. And that's because it's an 040. <laughs> now I know what you're thinking, it obviously doesn't look like an 040, it's got those trailing wheels at the back. But they are complete dummies, they are not really a part of the loco. They are suspended, the loco is resting absolutely no weight on those at all. The only weight that is on those wheels is the weight of the wheels themselves and the axle. And they're suspended, there's a fair bit of movement on them so that they're never pulled off the track or anything. And again, this all goes back to the weight issue. This is a lightweight 3D printed loco. Any weight resting on those rear trailing wheels would be completely wasted. So they are almost complete dummies. The fact that they turn is really all that they do. The entire loco is front heavy and supported by those driving wheels, which I think is quite interesting. And the fact that it stays on the track is really something as well. But yeah, same sort of motor in this one, little cordless motor. Bit more room for some extra weight in the boiler this time because the mechanism is only a little bit larger than the one I put into the Manning Wardle, so you've got plenty of room in this one. And yeah, as a runner, this one's really, really pleasing. I think it looks gorgeous with a few coaches. Maybe I should get some more for it, actually. That would be nice. But with these Hornby four-wheelers, I think it pretty much does the job. So there you go, my LBSC Gladstone, one of my absolute favourites still to this day. So now we come to the summer of 2022, and this next loco was inspired by a trip to the National Railway Museum in York. And while I was there, I saw this locomotive. It is the Furnace Railway Number no. 3, or Old Copper Knob, and I was just fascinated by this locomotive. 
And when I first saw it, I thought, wouldn't it be nice to make a model of this thing? And then my second thought was, no, it wouldn't. It would be a horrendous challenge to try and make something so tiny and so unconventional as a steam locomotive goes. But I thought and thought about it, my mind was working away on how it would be possible, and before I knew it, I was working on a CAD design. And this is the loco that was born at the end of a lot of months' hard work. Possibly my favourite of all the locos I've created. I don't think she's the most complex of the locos I've built. I think the last one that you're going to see at the end of this video, that's probably the most complex. But this one was easily the most difficult in terms of how to motorise something so tiny. Old Copper Knob, or more formally the Furnace Railway No. 3, was an 040 tender engine built over 175 years ago in 1846. Its famous nickname, of course, comes from the copper cladding which covered the dome-shaped firebox. The engine was built by Burry, Curtis and Kennedy of Liverpool, and it was one of just four Furnace Railway A2 locomotives ever to be built. Following withdrawal, number three was preserved in a glass case at Barrow, where it remained until being damaged by a German bomb during the Second World War. The engine still bears the shrapnel wounds to this day, although I didn't represent these on the model. Since being preserved, it has been operated from time to time, in 1996 for instance, but currently it's on static display at the National Railway Museum in York. And while I think this was the most detailed loco I'd ever created at the time, I think it's more impressive from a technical standpoint, because obviously it's 3D printed, there's no metalwork on it, and yet it's still heavy and it's still loco drive motorised. And that's because the motor sits vertically inside the copper knob dome, which leaves the boiler completely empty for a load of weight to be put into it. And so this is an excellent, excellent hauler. Weighs just nearly 100 grams, I think. And given how tiny it is compared with the other locos, I was really, really proud of that. But still, the lining went pretty well on the loco. Not so much in some places, but again on the boiler, it seemed to work well. I was always so proud of that copper coloured paint that I managed to put on the firebox and some of the details on there came out quite nicely as well. The chassis design was really quite complex because there was no way to create a big fat chassis block to put all of the mechanism into. No, it was all made up of a framework in real life and I wanted my model to reflect that. So yeah, it's a very sort of bare bones looking loco and on the bottom half you can kind of see right through it, which is really cool. But yeah, got lots of detail on this. The tender in particular is absolutely amazing. Not saying my work's amazing, I'm just saying Copper Knob's tender in general is amazing. And the fact that I was able to recreate this is something I am really, really proud of, even down to its odd looking brake rigging. So yeah, possibly my favorite 3D printed loco, old Copper Knob, it was absolutely tremendous to design. I can't begin to tell you how much I enjoyed doing this one. And the fact that it turned out half decent as well is just a bit of a bonus. But let's get it down onto the track. Let's see how it performs. So here you have it then, the smallest space into which I have ever crammed a mechanism. And I'm really at the mercy of those coreless motors again. They are so good that even though there's very little gearing in here, it really is just a worm drive interfacing with the gear on the axle. Just like the Hornby train set 040s are, except this coreless motor has got such good torque right down to the slow speeds and the driving gear is quite large on the driving axle of the loco so it can still perform amazingly i mean it can still crawl it's still really smooth as you can see i got really really lucky with that again and like i say because there was enough space in the boiler therefore to put some weights it's not that bad a hauler either it can haul a lot more than this as you've seen in the past but yeah, this I think is probably my favourite loco that I've created. I just loved the prototype the moment I saw it, and I thought when I first saw it how unlikely it was that I would be able to create a model of this. And yet, a few months later, I had one in my hands. So it was a good lesson to me. It was never dismiss anything until you've really looked at it carefully and done your best with it, because there's a very good chance that anything is possible if this thing is possible. And I'm certainly going to keep that in mind as I move forward with more locos. So there you go, Furnace Railway number three, gorgeous, gorgeous copper knob. One of my favourite locos in the whole collection, really. Not because it's one of the best, but because I spent such a, a lovely amount of time just working on this and thoroughly enjoying every second of it. 
So the next loco was born in the autumn of 2022 and it's a real departure from the rest. At this point I'd been working towards making more and more realistic and accurate models whereas this next one was completely fictitious, made up entirely and intended to be a bit of fun. And this loco was of course Gresley's Rocket. And this loco was entirely fan powered. A lot of people saw the videos I made on this and assumed that the fan was a decoration and that actually it was just driven by its wheels. Well that's not true, there is no drive to these wheels. As you can see they are totally free to turn, it is entirely fan powered. And because this thing was supposedly designed by Sir Nigel Gresley, I took a lot of inspiration from Gresley's A4 locomotives with the streamlining and of course the garter blue colour. And I also came up with a bit of a backstory for this loco, and that went like this. Gresley's Rocket was an experimental locomotive constructed personally by Sir Nigel Gresley in 1912. After being appointed the chief mechanical engineer of the Great Northern, the vehicle was constructed in secret only to be revealed when he arrived at work on it. Powered only by a large fan, the vehicle was driven by a steam turbine coupled to a gearbox which produced a top speed upwards of 90 miles per hour. Gresley's rocket was used by Gresley to monitor the operations on the Great Northern and later the LNER and he would cruise around the railway network performing spot checks for efficiency and reprimanding the workforce for any malpractice. By the grouping of 1923, Gresley's rocket had become famous among the public. Hordes of <clears throat> fans would gather to watch Gresley zoom past at high speed on his way to work, a relatively short-lived but hugely impressive spectacle. Gresley would occasionally allow others to ride his unique locomotive, although this tradition came to an abrupt end when the loco crashed into a buffer stop with his adolescent son on board. The boy was ejected from the vehicle and crashed into a building. The good news was that the building was a mattress factory, the bad news was that the mattresses were, of course, inside the building and not plastered all over the outside walls, so Gresley's son hit solid brick and was flattened. And this loco is clearly a complete departure from all the rest. And really the design brief that I gave myself was completely different for this one. This was not supposed to be detailed and complex, this was supposed to be as simple as possible, and because it was fan driven with a relatively weak motor, it had to be really lightweight as well. So all of the detailing on the body is just sort of 3D printed in place, although because I was a lot better at 3D printing at this point than I was when I made the prototype loco, I've been able to do a bit better job of that. These of course had figures fitted to them, this one is Sir Nigel Gresley of course, these were not 3D printed, these were just fitted on. And then of course you've got the fan on the back which is inside a guard, obviously the old Triang turbo cars didn't have any sort of guard like this and as a result there's a bit of concern over people losing fingers on those. But obviously this has got a guard so it stops you being able to touch the fan which is a lovely bright red colour, which is of course the final A4 colour. Obviously A4s are garter blue, and then they've got the white and red lining on them. So yeah, it really does conjure up the A4 in a very strange way indeed. And of course, we all want to see this thing run, so let's get it down onto the track and let's do so. Well, here he comes and the crowds go wild. <laughs> Sir Nigel Gresley in his own creation. And there's not a lot to say about this one in terms of performance, other than that it still works. I'm quite impressed by that. And that the only real challenge with this was to make sure it was light enough and free rolling enough so that the fan wouldn't have to run at full speed in order to propel it. And as you can see, it's going quite fast now and I'm running it at about 80 speed. The other issue was pickups. I wanted to get reliable pickups on these without creating too much drag. Uh, sort of achieved that. I think the pickups are a little bit temperamental with these. They certainly do need a fair bit of cleaning and readjusting from time to time. But as you can see, once you get that sweet spot, uh, Gresley is on his way. But there you go, a little bit of fun. Not my favourite loco I've ever created, obviously. But I think it's probably the most whimsical one, isn't it? So there you have it, Gresley's Rocket. And now we come to the final loco that I've created to date, 2023. I didn't want to create something wacky and unrealistic like Gresley's Rocket. I wanted to go back to creating something prototypical or as close to prototypical as I could get. And of course, for this project, I selected the Great Eastern 552. 
a lovely old-fashioned loco hasn't been attempted by any professional manufacturers and the photos showed a good amount of detail on this thing that would be quite fun and also challenging to capture via 3D printing. And here is the final result, my Great Eastern 552 in the Great Eastern Blue livery. And this loco I think has more parts to it than any of the others I've created before. It's got a lot more detailed parts, the chassis is a lot more intricate and detailed and it also has a lot more parts to make it go. And I've also tried to tweak the design to make it a little bit easier to build and maintain and also paint during that process. But the 552 was quite an interesting loco in real life, so before I show you too much of the details on the model, let's talk about the real thing. The Great Eastern 552 was introduced in 1882 for general goods work. The first to be built was this example, number 552, and weighing in at 36 tonnes each, 10 were built in total by Kitson and company, and they were notable of course for their raised footplate which completely exposed the wheels. This differed from other similar designs, such as the J15, where the footplate actually covered the tops of the wheels, which themselves were smaller in diameter. The class was rebuilt in 1893, although this process resulted in very few external changes according to the drawings. The class was supposedly withdrawn between 1904 and 1906, and if that's accurate that would mean that these engines would never have appeared in anything other than Great Eastern liveries, so no LNER and no British Railways. And here she is, up close. Uh, yeah, I think this has to be my most detailed loco ever. It's still not perfect, I'm still not 100% happy with the lining in places, and I had to miss a little bit of it off on the side of the cabs for instance, but yeah, overall I have been able to improve I think. So the fine details are even finer than before. I do think this loco has the best ever buffer beam I've been able to do, complete with screw link coupling. And the tender on this loco is particularly pleasing as well. The decoration and the lining went a lot better on this one, uh, which I'm pleased with. That sort of proves that good lining can be done. And also the cab detail turned out pretty good as well. Really, really pleased with this one. Didn't try and do too much with this. I didn't try and paint all the gauges and such. I just wanted basic clean detail that looks good. And uh, I think it does. So there you have it. That is the Great Eastern 552. Even though the livery isn't 100% complete, I still think it's a, a lovely livery and that's largely down to the wheels I think and the coupling rods with the bright red and also the chrome coloured sections. So I have improved the performance on this since I did the review on it interestingly enough and let's have a run. I love running this one. And here she comes and yes yeah, she's perfectly happy with any sort of small sized freight train or small number of passenger coaches really. The Great Eastern 552 and you know when I first created this there was really no Great Eastern locos out there on the market. Now of course Acura Scale have announced their new book jumper locomotive so when those come out I'm going to be in trouble because then we'll see what a Great Eastern livery is supposed to look like on a model and not my attempt here but until then I can be satisfied with this. And I suppose when that does happen, I'll want to build another and try and improve on it. But no, for now, I'm going to leave it alone. I am happy with it, I think, for the time being. And yeah, this is a, a relatively standard mechanism, really. It was a breath of fresh air, really, to be able to build something that was relatively simple. Obviously, it's still a small loco, so there's not that much space inside for any weight. In fact, the amount of weight I could put into the boiler of this loco was the same as the amount I could put into copper knob. So that just goes to show you how efficient that copper knob design was with the motor in the firebox. But still, nice runner as you can see, looks pretty good as she runs along. The last loco for the time being that I've created. And there you have it. So there you have it, all six of my beloved 3D printed locos to date. Which one's your favorite? Please comment down below and let me know. Also, if you've got any suggestions for locos you'd like to see me create, also please do comment those down below and I will genuinely consider them. For now though, thank you so much for watching and I will see you very very soon for another video. Alright, cheers folks, you take care.